Hey, I'm Steve Sims, author of Bluefish in the Art of Making Things Happen, and I'm one of the passionate few. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of The Passionate Few. Today we have on the man who makes miracles happen, Mr. Steve Sims. He's the author of Blue Fishing, and you guys are gonna really enjoy his story. So with no further ado, thanks for being on the show today, Steve. It's an absolute pleasure. My man, so tell me, we've heard about you in the industry, the man who makes miracles happen. <laughs> Where did your story begin? And give the audience a little bit of what you do now. Well, let's go with what I do now. You mm -hmm. know, people contact me to get married in the Vatican, meet their favorite rock star to sing live on stage, go down and see the Titanic, uh, take over museums for, for a dinner party. So I, mm -hmm. I'm basically the, uh, the make a wish for people that can afford it. Yeah. Um, that's what I do now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very much different from where I came from. I'm a East London bricklayer mm -hmm. that uh, used to just spend his days you know, rolling around on a motorcycle and a black t-shirt. <laughs> Thankfully, I'm still able to do that part, but what I do now is vastly different from brick lane and working on a door. That's amazing. And I know you started, you said you were working in construction and then got sick of it. Is that true? Yeah. Oh, no, the, it was it was totally true. You know, I finished school at the age of 15. Mm -hmm. uh, in England, you finish a little bit earlier. Um, then you go to college. I didn't do the college thing. Uh, I finished school. The following day, my dad kicked me out of bed, went, right, you're working on a building site with me. So he owned a construction firm. And on this, on this building site was like my cousins, my uncle, my, my granddad. They were all on this site. And I could see my future all the way through to my granddad. And after about six months, I thought to myself, is this it? You know, is this, is this really what I'm going to be? I'm going to get like bad weather every day. I'm going to get smacked up, crapped on, cut up. Is this it? And so I just tried loads of different things to try and get out of there. And uh, I just tried some stupid things, but you know, I had to get out. How old were you at that time? Uh, 17, probably about 17. So I'd stuck with the building for a little while, too long. And then from there, obviously, I know you didn't have the insight to do what you do now. It was sort of an evolution of steps. How did you go from being a 17 year old construction worker who wanted more for his life to end up doing what you do now on mega platforms? I think while what I'm doing now is very different, I don't mm -hmm. think my mindset has actually ever changed. You know, I mean, I'm an Irish lad from London mm -hmm. who always questioned things. You know, why can't we go here? Why can't we do this? Why can't we get in there? Right. That's never changed. And so I was always this inquisitive kid. And I joke now, I'm 51 years old, and I joke that I'm a 51-year-old, four-year-old. Um, I'm constantly questioning, you want to do this? Why can't you do it? While so many people are going, I can't do that, I'm going, why can't I do that? And it's that different mindset that's just allowed me to get into many, many different opportunities. Mm -hmm. And do you find that that first time, that first breakthrough was when you went to Hong Kong, right? I know there was a, uh, a series of events that transpired where you ended up negotiating your way to end up working there. Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah, I was on a train heading for a building site and um, in London and this, this guy that was on the train was a guy I knew from school and he's got this sharp suit on. I'm sure if I saw it now, I wouldn't think it was sharp, but you know, from a guy that was dressed up in jeans, just going to get rained on, this guy had it all. And he right. was an intern in a bank. And this was in the eighties. And we got chatting, I remembered it from school. And I'm like, man, you know, you've got the life now. You're working in a bank, you know, you're working with girls, you're dry, you know, you got everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm on a building site with a bunch of old paddies, you know? <laughs> And for me, his life was brilliant. He told me that they were actually recruiting new interns. And mm -hmm. again, this was in the 80s when anyone could kind of get this job. Um, and they were recruiting new interns because they were sending a bunch of people over to Asia mm -hmm. into what was now called the tiger market. Mm -hmm. So I bought my dad's suit, went in for an internship interview. It was, in the, it was in this bank, walked in. I walked into the wrong room. Let's be honest, now it was the right room, but I walked into this room where they were talking about all of the people that they were sending overseas. And there was this massive great buffet, breakfast buffet. And I just remember thinking, well, I don't know if I'm gonna get this job, but I'm gonna personally challenge myself to see if I can eat this buffet. So I was eating the buffet and I was, they were talking about all the different things that they were doing. I didn't understand any of it, but I just remember them saying one thing near the end. And I'm halfway through probably my third platter. And they guys turned around, they went, make sure the girls at the back have got your name and address so we can send you the pack and the flight. And this was back in the 80s and 90s, so security's a bit different now. I just walked up to this girl and I'm sitting there eating my, uh, my, my croissant and my bagel and everything else. And I went, oh, 
Steve Sims. And uh, she looks at this form, she's like, we don't have you here. So I'm like, oh, for God's sake. Again, she's like, no, 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 she writes my name down and address. Then I leave. And uh, it was funny, you know, I went back, you know, and I spoke to my girlfriend and never even mentioned this. And then like two weeks later, I get this phone call. Um, that something's arrived at the house and it's a return ticket to Hong Kong. The date that I'm leaving, the welcome, and now like, something you want to tell me? And I'm like, damn, I didn't think I'd get, I went wow. for the free breakfast. I didn't think that was going to happen. <laughs> And then my wife was, uh, she was the one that said, look, you can't jump in the water with one foot, you know? So are you in or are you out? And that was the first moment where I went, I've got to try it, mm -hmm. you know? Because who, who, I'm more likely to fail at it, but I'm guaranteed to fail it if I don't try. Uh, so I, I went for it and I uh, turned up on the Saturday, <laughs> got drunk with them on the Saturday night, got drunk with them on the Sunday night, went to orientation on the Monday and I was fired on the Tuesday. So I had uh, uh, wow. one day, uh, one day of that career. Why'd you get fired? How'd that happen? Because they realized that this guy had somehow kind of like, you know, talked his way into getting a job yeah. and actually shouldn't have been in the room. And yeah. it was funny because when they, when I came into the office on the Tuesday, uh, the, the girl behind the bar said, oh yeah, behind the reception desk, behind the bar, behind the reception desk, she said, like, you know, you need to go in the boardroom mm -hmm. you know, the gentlemen are waiting for you. Right. So I'm thinking, oh, you know, what's going on? So I walk in there and there's these two guys. Now, I've always been a big guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's these two guys behind the table. And they're like, oh, hi, Steve. Uh, take a seat. Um, we can't find your, your Series 7 license. And I went, oh, no, I don't have that. Mm -hmm. And they went, oh, you know, you must have got the American equivalent, you know, mm -hmm. the, uh, the 11. No, I don't have that either. Yeah. And you could see him just trying to work out which one of them was going to break into this big ugly guy that he's just been fired right after oh, one day oh my god no one needed to because we just suddenly started falling apart with laughter and he went how did you get here <laughs> and i went it was a free breakfast so you know it was one of those <laughs> so you ended up telling him the whole story i told him the whole thing i told yeah. him it was the first time i'd ever had salmon <laughs> for breakfast so i ended up telling them and yeah. uh that was it and they went you know you're fired don't you and yeah. i went yeah i kind of got that um <laughs> But the funny thing was, because they had brought me over there, they had to give me my apartment, they had to give me the apartment, mm -hmm. which I shared with two other brokers for I think it was like uh, two months. Mm -hmm. And they had to give me some severance, which, you know, when I got the check, I was like, oh, it's a lot of money, but I was in Hong Kong. Right. Which was massively expensive. Of course. So that didn't last many days. Um, so you end up staying in Hong Kong at that stage? Yeah, I didn't know what I was gonna try. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there was this fateful day that I'm down in this bar and I'm outside and I'm just drinking my beer or my whiskey, can't remember what it was, and I'm just alone. Mm -hmm. And I'm outside the club, and this, this woman comes over, and she said, look, you've, we've seen you here a few days, and I didn't know where my life was gonna be. I was literally just wandering the streets during the day, then going back to an apartment where two brokers didn't like me by then. And um, she <laughs> Yeah, came. that's true, because they're, they're living with you, and they're oh, like, they're what the hell, why no, is he getting a free me. ride? And yeah. yeah, they hate me. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, the woman came up to me and she went, look, she said, um, we've got uh, some people in here, some, uh, some foreigners. Mm -hmm. She said, they're, they're being a bit leery. She said, we need to get them uh, quieting down. We need to get them out of here. Could you please do it? Because if you don't talk some sense into them, our people have to get involved and they're going to hurt them. Right. And um, over there, they don't, they don't mess around. You know, mm -hmm. the, 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 the security over there, they come out with sticks. Mm -hmm. Bang, head, car out, you're done. End of problem. So I just went in there, sat down at this table, and these, these about four or five guys are staring at me, biggish fellas. Um, and I went, look, boys, this is how it's going to be. Please pay your bill and leave. You know, you've, you've had your drink, you've had your fun, but you get a bit loud. Mm -hmm. um, or there's going to be a bunch of guys that run out of here with bats, and you're not going to see Tuesday. So <laughs> it's really your call. Yeah. I pray I see you walk out the front door. But if not, you've made your own decision. All the best guys, get up, leave, go back out front. Uh, as I walked past, I said to the woman, who I didn't know who it was, I mm -hmm. went, there you go, I'm done. And I sat down, back to me drink. And they left and they were like, oh, and she came over, she went, can you be the doorman? <laughs> I was like, yeah, oh, I've got nothing to do. And so yeah. I started working on the door of the clubs in uh, Hong Kong. Just like that? Just like that. I was the big ugly thing that seemed to be built for the job. And at that time, what's going through your mind? I'm just going to do this for now, wing it? Or yeah, what, you know, what? it was always a case of wing it and see. Yeah, um, looks I, like it turned out not too bad. Well, the funny thing was I knew that See, I've never failed at anything in my life. Mm -hmm. I've just learned what didn't work. Mm -hmm. And I'm now in Hong Kong. 
I'm running out of money fast. I don't have any job opportunities, but hang on a minute. Six months ago, I was working on a building site. Mm -hmm. Surely this is a step forward. Mm -hmm. So I've just got to be able to see it. Right. Um, so I started looking for that opening. Mm -hmm. um, and I started doing door work. And some of the nights, the clubs were really low. Mm -hmm. And I could see they were low. And if people with money were coming over that were local that you got to see a few times, mm -hmm. you'd tell them not to come in here, walk down the road, speak to, to Omar and tell him that Sim sent you. Mm -hmm. And... Um, They'd be like, oh, no one ever gets turned away from a club and told to go, go to a better one. Right, yeah. But I was doing that. And then the, 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 the Mama San and the, the owners of the club were like, what are you doing? I'm like, they're going to come in here once. They're never going to touch you again. But now I can guarantee you they're coming back Friday because I told them Friday's the night. Right. So now the job is to make Tuesday the night as well. Mm -hmm. So we started kind of just throwing some cool parties during the week, getting different crowds in. And I started without realizing it, building up a network. Mm. And then the network started to get bigger. And then I had a few people going, hey, we want to throw a birthday party. Or there's a party going on at the yacht, but I don't know how to get in. And I'll be mm -hmm. like, I'll try, you mm -hmm. know. And then I'll get them in. I'll be like, oh, it's two grand. Yeah, mm -hmm. four people, 500 bucks a person, two grand. Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, great. I realized very easily that people like paying for things. <laughs> it's a very easy transaction. <laughs> right. If I come up to you and I go, hey, you know, can you do me a favor? And I'd, I'd really like you to do this. But if I'm more transparent and can come up and go, hey, I need this, 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 um, and I'll give you two grand for it. Does that work for you? Mm -hmm. Then it's an open and closed case. Right. Yeah, that works for me. Fantastic. It's a win-win situation. You know what you're getting out of it now. Mm -hmm. I know what I'm getting. It's just a simple transaction. And that's, that's what I found so easy, yet that so many people were avoiding doing. And what's really interesting about that is that as fascinating as it is, you also build a reputation of being trustworthy. So you're building a network, but you're also building it from a place of, um, I guess, respect right from the get. So now you have leverage and connections that trust you and respect you, and then you can leverage it and build things out of it. Is that correct? Yeah, I never went, <laughs> that sounds very silly to say here on film, yeah. I never went for, for trust and respect. Right. Um, I always went for transparency. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I wanted it to be impossible for you to misunderstand mm -hmm. what I wanted. And I find that that trust um, comes when you feel comfortable and confident about mm -hmm. something. True. And you're co comfortable and confident about something when you understand it. Right. So there's this, this, this strange guy in front of you with his earrings and his tattoos and that, and he's asking you for something, mm -hmm. but making it crystal clear what he wants and making it crystal clear what he can offer. Mm -hmm. This is an easy thing to understand. It either resonates or it doesn't. Right. Um, and I think that's where the trustworthy came because I'm a great believer. I'm smarter in my stomach than I am in my head. Mm -hmm. So if I meet someone and my head goes, well, he's got a 20 grand watch on, you know, he's looking sharp. That's a Prada suit. He's got a haircut. He's talking suave. He's saying big words. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if this little fella here is going, something's not right here, mm -hmm. that overtakes. Because every right. time I've trusted that, I've got it wrong a few times. Mm -hmm. But this has never let me down. And where did that gut take you once you started building that relationship and those networks and those parties and kind of charging people for favors? How did you decide to scale that or to keep running with it? I mean, what was, what was going through your mind at that time? <laughs> so this is where any credibility that I had is, is, just goes out the window. <laughs> I had this idea that if I knew a lot of rich people, mm -hmm. then they would give me a job. Right. So it's no good marketing to poor people because they can't afford you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would market to rich people. Right. That seemed to make sense to me. So any of the events I would put on, and now the events are going from clubs to penthouses to yachts and even in other countries of Asia mm -hmm. and uh, also getting into other people's parties. Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself, if I get this network of people that I can speed dial and just phone up and go, hey, Omar, it's Steve, and you know who I am, without right. me having to go, it's Steve, we met at the bar, right. and give a bio, that <laughs> sooner, or later, sooner or later, you would offer me a job. Right. And it was the only time in my life that I never, ever asked for something, mm. which was weird. I look back at it now and I go, hmm, maybe if I'd have asked these people and gone, hey, you've got a real estate firm, you got a can I get a job? I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. Right. But I ask for absolutely everything all day, mm -hmm. But that was a time that I didn't. So as I'm growing, thinking, oh, I'm going to get a job, I'm going to get a job, without realizing I was building up this network. Mm -hmm. I was being known for my ability to do. Mm -hmm. I was becoming credible. I was becoming easy to understand. It was very simple for someone to go, 
Steve Sims, you know, the funny guy over there with the accent and, you know, mm -hmm. looking weird or tough or whatever. Um, I've had some weird ex explanations of, of me, <laughs> but that fellow over there, that's the man that can. Mm. And that's all that mattered. People come over me and they go, oh, I, I'm going to Monaco and I hear you're the guy that can get into the best parties or you know where the best access is. I think that's about right. You know, what do you need? Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, well, now, okay, it's probably going to cost you about 15 grand. Give me five grand, I'll start. Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, oh, okay. And of course, as soon as it happens, then yeah. they would go on. So I was, I was the poster child for referral business. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because as we got to like 2000 and we started doing well, and we'd, we've been doing this for 20 odd years now. Wow. Started in like 94. It was about 97 that I was still kind of going to weird events. Mm -hmm. And I say weird because they'd be like banking expos or, you know, like real estate things trying to see how I could maybe get in the right position to get offered a job. Right. Um, then my wife came to me and she went, why are you wasting your time with this? Mm -hmm. You fly around the planet. People know what you do. They pay you to do what you do. We're living in a penthouse because you're paid to do this. Mm -hmm. Why are you looking for another job? Why don't you just concentrate on the one you got? Mm -hmm. We didn't. I didn't realize that I actually had a job. <laughs> um, you just I, saw it as kind of doing little like barters, like little deals on the side, right? You didn't look at I it just as a full saw it as hustling. Business. I just saw that I was doing I was doing this for you and I got 10 grand. I was doing this for you and I got two grand. Doing this for you, got 50 grand. So did you start out charging premiums? Do you remember the first thing you ever charged for? What was it and what yeah, was it? Yeah, it was a party. It was a <laughs> it was a yacht party. I was I was on the door mm -hmm. uh, in a place called Wan Chai, which was like the Soho of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And uh, these four guys came up and they'd gone to into my clubs various times and um they went, oh, you know, we wanted to go to the yacht party tonight. And I was like, oh, well, why aren't you going to the yacht party? And these were, you know, big, successful, you know, foreigners. Right, big wigs, Perfect yeah. crowd for this party. <laughs> and um, they went, oh, you know, we, we can't get into that event. Oh, okay. So they went inside. And I just said to the guy on the door, I said, um, can you give me like half hour? And he was like, yeah, go ahead, Steve. So I went down to the, uh, the, uh, the yacht and the yacht party was going to kick off that night. And so I just walked straight up. There's a girl there with a clipboard. And I walked up and I said, look, I've got four people coming here tonight. Um, I believe you're starting at 8 o'clock. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Would you like them here at uh, 7.45 or 8.15? What's going to be better for you? Mm -hmm. And I only asked her a question yeah. that she could answer me with a, with a response that I wanted. Right. And she's like, oh, what's that name? So I gave the four names. And she's like, oh, I can't find them on the list. Oh, well, um, that's not what I asked. Did you want them here at 7.45 or 8.15? Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to work out what would be better for you. I don't want you stuck with a bottleneck. I appreciate what it's like to work on the door. I've been there. Right. And she's like, oh, um, 8.15. Let me just make a note of that name again. So she wrote the names down. I said, thank you so much. And I just put my hand in my pocket, just gave her 100 bucks. I said, mm -hmm. thank you so much. I appreciate that. And she was like, oh, um, here's my card. And I was like, great. <laughs> Let me know of any other events you got going on. I went back to the club and I went, boys, you still want to go to the party tonight? And she was like, they were like, yeah, but we can't get in. You can now. Two grand, 500 bucks a person. And you're in. Cough it up. And they literally went, there you go. And I went, wow. good. You speak to Michelle, look after her on the door because she's a nice girl and have a good night. Then I went back to my door and they kind of like stepped out and they're like, cheers, Steve. I was like, see you later. And they didn't come back. And then two days later, they were like, I don't know how you did that, but <laughs> Michelle thinks you're great. And I had just not gone along with the habit that we see in so many networking events now of people over amplifying themselves or oh, trying yeah. to be so oh hi yeah yeah my name's so i do this you know i i'm gonna i just went in and i went hey how can we make this easy for you mm -hmm. and i just made it very simple um simple to be impossible to misunderstand and that was my first gig and i remember going That's home amazing. claire was actually in england at the time mm -hmm. and i got two thousand bucks i think i just got two thousand bucks for that mm -hmm. all i did was walk up the door and i all, what i couldn't get out of my head <laughs> was why they hadn't walked up to the door. Right. They were affluent. They, they looked the role model. You know, they, these were four good-looking, affluent lads. Mm -hmm. uh, they had money. They had all the trinkets. They had the watch, the suit, the business cards, the title, the expense account. They had everything. Right. These were perfect people to be in your party, mm -hmm. but they hadn't just walked up. They had nayed themselves to death that this was an impossible event <laughs> that they couldn't have gone into. So that was my first, that was my first eye opener. And um, 
it's got bigger over the years. Right. The events I've done, of course, every time I do something that's large, I just go, huh, how, the, how did I get in there? Oh, well, and of course, like then the next one never looks as big or scary. What's been the most, uh, I'm sure you've been asked this, but what's been some of the most memorable ones? I know there was one involving and Andre Bocelli. Uh, can you share a little bit about that and any other one that might have been my, like... my duet buddy? Um, <laughs> so I had a client that uh, he's worked with me many times before. So he knows pe people come to us with a dream mm -hmm. and then we blue fish it. You know, we go, well, OK, that's very nice. But that ain't going to cut it. Let's see how far we can take this. And we always try to go. up. So this guy came to us. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm visiting Florence, uh, Italy. I want to go to an exclusive restaurant. Make it happen. All right. Knowing the guy wanted something very private, very exclusive, very high level, very memorable, very impactful, that doesn't exist in Florence. Not that Florence is a bad place. It's one of my favorite places in the world. But Tuscan living is all about... You walk into a restaurant, you ask for a table, uh, a place for two. They stick you on a table of 22, and by the end of the night, you've got 15 new mums, 16 new sisters. <laughs> you've just enlarged your family. That's the whole point. You're like, hey, mm. pass me the olive oil. And you got that kind of life. That's yeah. what Tuscan living is about. Communal culture, absolutely. Yeah. You don't have that in New York. Right. You have those private clubs. And he wanted this in Florence mm -hmm. where it didn't exist. So we knew we had to... We knew we had to manipulate it. We knew we had to invent something. Right. So we wanted, again, to see how far we could go. If you're going to have the most exclusive restaurant in Tuscany, in Florence, where's it going to be? So we started going, OK, you've got Diamo, which is the massive cathedral people see. You've got uh, the Palazzo de Vecchio, which is like the big main square. You've got the Academia, which houses Michelangelo's David. Well, hang on a minute. A lot of people don't know the two that I've just mentioned, but Michelangelo's David is more famous than the Statue of Liberty. Everyone knows Michelangelo's David. They may not know where it is, but they know the David. I wonder if we could set up a table of six at the feet of Michelangelo's David. So I contacted the museum that houses it, started speaking with them, and we ended up doing that. And once we got there, then I thought, well, okay, we're in a museum, what's the downside? I always, I'm a, I'm a cynic. I hate everything until I'm told to love it. And I thought to myself, in a museum, the problem is it's quiet. Unlike here with the planes going over. Right. Um, you're sitting in a place eating food, deadly quiet. Yeah. So I thought that's not going to work. We've got to get some entertainment in there. So let's, what can we get in there? Can we get an orchestra not big enough? Can we get a single singer? Uh, string quartet? Uh, that's a little bit better. So we started going down this route. And then I thought to myself again, shooting for the moon. What would be the most amazing knock your socks off, wake you up at two o'clock in the morning, sweating, going, holy shit, I can't believe that happened. Right. Let's get the most famous <laughs> Italian singer ever to sing for us. Yeah. That's like being in America and, and waking <laughs> up Elvis and having him sing for you, you know? Yeah. So we reached out to Andrea Bocelli's people, mm -hmm. told them what we were doing, and a uh, few, few steps went through, but we actually got Andrea Bocelli, and I told my client... I've got a local singer mm -hmm. to come in. So my client didn't even know who was coming. No clue. So I just, I went over to him at the table and I went, look, we had the string quartet going. And I said, I do apologize. Um, we had a singer come in and I love doing the anti-climax thing. Right. We had a singer coming in, uh, but he hasn't turned up. I've managed to find a new one. I've got a local <laughs> singer. I believe he's good. Mm -hmm. Let's see, are you okay with that? And he's like, what are you doing, Steve? You know, and I'm like, it should be okay. Everything should be fine. So then I walk back and I'm like, he's here now. And so he's like, ah. So then all of a sudden, Andre Bocelli gets escorted out. To, and they're like, oh my God. You know, so <laughs> then, he, uh, then he serenaded the clients and he did about a 30, maybe a 30 minute set. That's you know, amazing. Singing some of his things with a string quartet and a piano. How did you get in touch with uh, Andrea Bocelli to set that up? <laughs> well, that's not the question. Um, anyone can. You know, you can go on now and you can Google contact Andrea Bocelli and you'll get his fan club, you'll get his Twitter page, you'll get his agent, you'll get his manager and all of these people won't get you anywhere closer. Right. So I'm a great believer in piggybacking connections. So I had been working at the Vatican 
um, and I've been doing some stuff for, for a client there that wanted to get married in the Vatican and blessed by the Pope. Well, we're going to get into that one too because we definitely want to hear that story. All right. That's a pretty cool gig. Um, so my question was that I needed to get a hold of Andrea Bocelli. I only had two days in order to be able to do it. So what I did was I phoned up the Vatican. I went, have you ever worked with Andrea Bocelli? And they said, yes. I went, well, okay then. Could you do me a favor? Make a phone call, tell them I'm real. And they went, okay. So they phoned up Andrea Bocelli. Of course, when the Vatican phoned you, that's a pretty good phone call to have. Right, right, right. And um, they mentioned me and they ended up phoning me and they said, what time would you like in there? <laughs> Nine o'clock, please. <laughs> now, the funny thing That's was... incredible. The funny thing was that we had two days. Right. With time zone difference, we only had one and a half. Mm -hmm. For banking days, only one whole day. So I told her, look, you know, I'm pleased you're coming over. <clears throat> Let me know what this is going to cost. Mm -hmm. So she gave me a number. That's fine. I, I have to be honest with you, though. We have a problem. She said, what's the problem? And I said, well... My bank in America, Los Angeles, we're now here in, in Italy. Mm -hmm. By the time I push this through, it's only going to be one bank in day. You'll get it in two days, but that means basically with the time zone, you're going to get it the day after mm -hmm. you've performed. Mm -hmm. Is that a problem? And she turned around, Andrea's wife, and she said, based on who it was that phoned us up, I think you're good for it. <laughs> so mm -hmm. with the standing joke that we had Andrea Bocelli that night on credit, <laughs> so uh, it was a pretty good gig. That's unbelievable. And then it, how did that relationship first build with the Vatican? A lot of people, um, a lot of people nay themselves mm -hmm. uh, and are very scared of things. Get in their and, own way, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Greg Reed says it the best. That He said that it's the size of your butt that stops you going forward, you know. <laughs> but I can't do this. But I, can't, I don't have enough money. But I'm not good looking at me, I've just stepped forward mm -hmm. and worried about the rest later. Right. And when I got approached and they wanted to actually um, do something in the Vatican, the first thing I did was like, well, okay, I've got to get someone uh, doing something with the Vatican. What's my first step? I've got to talk to someone that's Catholic. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a, an obvious <laughs> but easy right. step. Step one, yeah. You know, so you phone up someone that's Catholic. I phoned up my local church. And I went, you know, what needs to happen in order for me to get here. Mm. And um, you get a few people going, oh, I don't know. Oh, I can't help you with that. Oh, no, that's too big. You know, you're constantly dealing with naysayers. The more right. people say that it can't happen, the better, because it makes me look brilliant. Right. Okay. So as people realize that all it is is a question, you've just got to ask the right question to the right person, then I'm out of business. Right. And I, I hope one day I am, because I'd <laughs> like to live in that world. Um, but then I started phoning up people, and then I started thinking, well, the Vatican's in Italy, therefore I've got to speak to people in Italy. Mm -hmm. you know? So these were just obvious steps to me. Mm -hmm. And I ended up speaking with a family in Florence that are, are very powerful. And I said, look, you know, I'm trying to do this at the Vatican. I've got, to, I've got to be able to speak to someone that's in a connected state that they're going to take me seriously. Mm -hmm. I said, you know anyone that's you know, connected with the Vatican that could help me? As luck would have it, and they all say luck is, you know, hard work and position. They turned around, they went, that would be us. We can make that call for you. Wow. I said, well, okay, you can make that call for me. Will you make that call for me? Mm -hmm. And they went, yes, we will. Great. So, you know, then, uh, then you've got to make sure you do something for them. Right. But getting, getting your foot in the door is one thing. Mm -hmm. Being so irresistible that they don't want you to leave, that's a completely different bowl of soup. That's where the so, art begins. That's where the art begins. You've got to make sure that when you go along with someone, you educate, entertain, and uh, uh, engage the person. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to make sure that they know very quickly, why are you there? And more importantly, what's in it for them to keep you there? Right. And I think it's so important because a lot of people miss that. Would you agree? Is that instead of focusing on what they get out of it, you've got to be able when you connect with people to make it win-win. They have to win. They have to benefit. And if you don't have that value, you're not going to get very far if you're just focused on what's in it for you and I need this and I want this. Would you agree with that? 100%. You know what's in it for you. Mm -hmm. And here's a couple of things where your gut comes into it again. You know what's in it for you. So when you're on the phone with someone, mm -hmm. You're just waiting to lay it down what's in it for you, what you want, right. okay? The other person knows that there's something in it for you because you phoned them. <laughs> right. But they don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. So that's where the stomach's going, okay, why have I got this person on the phone? 
Mm -hmm. You've got seconds before they go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm too busy. Right, yeah. Yeah? So you've got to get on the phone and use the same focus to be able to come around and go, Omar, thanks for having me on the phone. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about this because I believe you've got a new book coming out. You've got a foundation. You've got a new project. Mm -hmm. I believe I can help you with that. Mm -hmm. Now, I've got an ask, but I'm hoping that we can marry the two that is of benefit to you. Right, make it win-win. Straight off the bat, hit them up. And I believe getting it out in the open mm -hmm. sells that little fella in your stomach and they can go, he wants this. And he's going to give me this, or he's going to work on this. I can deal with that. I understand that. I've got no suspicion. Right. It's crystal clear why this clown's in front of me. All right, I can live with that. Yeah, transparency breeds trust, absolutely. Transparency is brilliant. Screw authenticity. Mm -hmm. I think authenticity is just a coffee mug and a, and a mouse pad slogan, a logo <laughs> that we had because we were tired of 10x and everything. Yeah. <laughs> Last year it was 10x. The year before it was hacks. Mm -hmm. Do you remember everything was a, yeah. a life, life hack? hack yeah. um, so we had 10x and then this year it's authenticity. Mm -hmm. God knows what it'll be next year. <laughs> next year is probably going to screw me up. Next year is probably going to be transparent. <laughs> uh, I got to ask, what was the story with the Pope? Someone was blessed by the Pope. Is that one of your clients? Yeah. Talk so, about, a little bit about that one. So we, um, he wanted to get married in the Vatican. So he, he calls you or you call him? He called me. We get, we get a lot of people. You know, our website doesn't have a phone number. Right. You know, we are the epitome of a referral business. Mm -hmm. And when our clients start realizing that we can, mm -hmm. they just start dreaming. They get a couple of whiskeys in them and then they phone you up or text you at 2 o'clock in the morning going, I was watching Mission Impossible where he scaled up that building in Dubai. I want to do that on Tuesday. Nine times out of ten, they wake up in the morning, they go, please delete that text, I do not want to do that. But you get some of them that go, I do fancy that, yeah. you know? I do want to do those things. And we go, all right, be careful what you wish for. So we had this client that wanted to get married in the Vatican. We went through a number of steps to find people that could get us in front of the Vatican. I spent about three months flying in and out of Rome, speaking to people, um, getting through that red tape. And the deal was that we wanted to get this ceremony done in the Vatican and then have the Pope come through halfway through uh, during the, uh, um, when you give your, um, your testimonials and when you give your speeches, well, then you would go in and they would, uh, the, uh, the Pope would actually bless you. And then that's your, your ceremony. And the daft thing is, well, it's not daft, but the Vatican won't allow any photography right. in the Vatican during this ceremony. Right. So... They had a brilliant time, but they've got no photographs of it. No so that was a... I couldn't even get a selfie. I actually tried to get a selfie with the Pope, which would have been the world's greatest selfie. And yeah. uh, I went for my pocket like this. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you saw people just, just came in. I was like, well, okay then. Yeah. And they went, no pictures. Apparently, because of the... Um, if that photograph leaked out, mm -hmm. they would be able to look through the windows and see the position of some of the private papal rooms that they hold ceremonies in. Mm -hmm. And for, for fear of, of terrorists, they don't want people knowing, hang on a minute, okay, so that's the room. Gotcha, you know, yeah, so yeah, that makes we sense. We weren't allowed any photography in that room. That makes sense. And so the Pope literally came in halfway through to bless them. Mm -hmm. And that just came from your connections, being able to ask, hey, I want to make this happen. Just asking enough people enough people that can, yeah. um, having the credibility, having the transparency, um, and just, yeah, just making it clear what, what you wanted. And enough people have called you to this point now where you've actually built a life and a business around it that's been able to sustain you for a long time. Yeah. What is the 17-year-old construction working Steve, looking at the Steve now, what's he thinking about what you've done? Well, he's still here. Yeah. Um, he was still the kind of uh, um, uneducated idiot that drank too <laughs> much whiskey and rode bikes too fast. He's still sitting here on this couch, mm -hmm. bewildered that A, he's in some of the rooms he's in, mm -hmm. but more astounded why people aren't doing it themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I physically just go numb when I meet someone and they go, I would like to do this, but I can't do that. I don't have enough money. I don't have your connections. I don't. They seem to spend so much focus on the reason why they can't rather than the reason why they should. Mm -hmm. And it just, just annihilates me. And I'm sitting <laughs> there going, you've just, 
given me one request and then the next two seconds killed every reason why it should happen. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm just dumbfounded by that. So the 17 year old is still here. Uh, I'm very fortunate that I get to do the things I do with the people I do. I can't, I, I'm not giving a plug for the book, but when we were putting the book out, I asked a few people for just a little testimonial. And I've never relied on clients. Right. I never mentioned the people that I work with, right. but I reached out and I went, oh, I've got a book coming out. And apparently the book should have some you know, people on the back. Right. You know, I got Elton John, Forbes, entrepreneur calling me the modern day wizard of Oz, Peter Diamandis, the, the founder of the X Prize. Yes. Jason Gaynard and Joe Polish, just to some of them, <laughs> saying, and I, I look, I still look at that and I go, are you kidding? You know, <laughs> these people are saying nice things about me. Yeah. Well, some of them are. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm still, I'm still dumbfounded that I get to do the stuff I do. And I've seen photos of you uh, also with now President Trump, Elon Musk. Yeah, um, how did you one. get in, how did you get involved with them, or where were those events? Were there times where you've worked with them, or events where you were there? Or? Yeah, so um, I've worked a lot for Richard's charity. Mm -hmm. So I bumped into Sir Richard, Richard Branson. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so it's so, sorry, full title, Sir Richard Branson. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've done some work with uh, him and his mum Eve, um, and then uh, Elon down. Sorry, Elon Musk. At uh, Tesla and SpaceX, mm -hmm. and uh, um, Peter Diamandis at uh, X Prize, um, so, and Donald Trump, the one that uh, is a bit humorous now. Um, I was living in Palm Beach, mm -hmm. and there was a, a few events that they were holding at uh, Mar a Lago right. that uh, we ended up marketing and promoting for them and working with them mm -hmm. uh, and getting the right kind of clientele to come in. So I was able to kind of like uh, knock around and you know sink a few whiskeys with. Uh, President Donald Trump. No way. Which was never a title that I thought I would be. Uh, you know, stood at the bar in Mar-a-Lago drinking whiskey. I didn't think I was drinking whiskey with the future <laughs> president of America. Wow. So uh, that was quite interesting. Well, what was he like sitting down with him? Yeah, you see, you've got, you've got Donald Trump, who is a great media magnet, mm -hmm. hustler, businessman, and for whatever you think of him as a businessman, you can't take those elements away from him. Right. You know, the guy knows the art of making a deal. Mm -hmm. And he is thick-skinned, focused, determined, and as a strategic businessman that will utilize every loophole mm -hmm. to, to his benefit, right. he's it. He is Gordon Gecko. He is that master businessman. Mm -hmm. um, and just as a marketer as well, just how he looks at it and goes, well, hang on, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do it over here because more people want it there. Mm -hmm. You know, he knows that stuff. Mm -hmm. So to have actually been in, in, in that, that, that space mm -hmm. um, was quite, quite wonderful for me, quite mm -hmm. impactful. And I do a lot of consulting for marketing companies now. Right. I learned so much from watching how that man hustles a deal out. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, it wasn't even about the deal at the time, just being able to be him and listen, seeing how we kind of envisages things and, and his perspective. That was, empowerful, uh, that was impactful and powerful for me. Of course, now fast forward, he's now doing it in a very political space. Right. He's doing it in a space where the art of making a deal in the business world can be revered. The art of doing it in a presidential position can be scowled upon. Mm -hmm. So it's funny how he's gone from, from one pond to another. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite interesting. But, you know, his family, his kids, we did a breakfast. We had a client wanted to have breakfast with his kids once. Really? Um, so we arranged that they went up to New York and had breakfast with the kids. Um, and then uh, Donald came down just to kind of like, you know, finish off the meal. So no. that was quite fun. <laughs> no, so. that was recent? No, that was about a year before he announced his presidency. Wow. So you've built relationships now to where it's a lot easier, or is it still a bit of a challenge for you? Um, the existing relationships I maintain because I nurture them. I'm mm -hmm. a great believer in I want a 300-year-old oak tree. Mm -hmm. um, when you plant an oak tree, it's a, it's a tiny little seed mm -hmm. that for many, many years, it can be trampled on, it can be eaten by birds, it can be squashed. You've got to feed it, you've got to water it, you've got to prune it, you've got to trim it. Once it gets to the size of a 300-year-old oak tree, you can drive a bus into it and it's still strong. Mm -hmm. So my job is to get it from, hey, I've just met you, to 300-year-old oak tree as fast as possible. I have to nurture it, I have to water it, I have to care for it, I have to prune it of any of the shit. You know, I have to make sure 
that this thing's fertilized accurately and built up with strength. So then you get to a situation where you can just send someone a text and go, I want to pop over Tuesday. I've got a couple of people in town. Are you okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Bingo. See you Tuesday. That's you incredible, know? yeah. But the relationship still needs to be nurtured that you don't want to kill it with asks. Right. So you want to make sure that when you're not asking for something, giving. you're giving. Mm -hmm. So your contacts and we go, hey, we haven't spoken for six months, but I did see that you were involved in this. I'd like to send my clients visually to that cause so they can pick up your book. They can sign up for your petition. They can get behind that new product. You know, you have it. And just make sure that they're benefiting from something. Right. So that you're always lining it up ready for your ask. <laughs> yeah. And, and do you find that a lot of people have emulated your business model and tried to unsuccessfully? Because I know there's a lot of concierge services. And I heard somewhere you saying that a lot of them have piggybacked kind of on your guys' success and saying, hey, you know, do you want to do you want to have lunch on the Titanic? Or, or You guys had something like that, right? Something yeah, about the Titanic. Yeah, we sent clients down to see the Titanic. Yeah, uh, send them down in a submarine to see the Titanic. Correct. And I know that un other concierge services or other um, yeah, you know, bluefish it. agencies try to like piggy bank on that and promote it. Um, what's your thought on people who've tried to emulate what you guys have built with Bluefish? So there's two things. Um, the way I've built my business mm -hmm. and the way that I've built up my connections, I want everyone to emulate. Right. You know, um, it's the only thing you can't download an app for, building up a relationship. <laughs> True. So I want people to actually start focusing on those those methods and those tips and those tricks and those hacks or whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. But these very simple strategies that I use to be able to formulate the relationships and the ROI on those relationships, I want you to do that. It's no secret source. It's in a book. It's on my feeds. It's everywhere to be seen. Do it. Mm -hmm. The concierge firms, uh, and it's a strange business because it's still relatively new right although now we've got a concierge yeah you know, i dropped my dogs off the other day at the vet and there was a vet concierge that checks <laughs> your dog in it wasn't the front desk anymore it was the vet concierge yeah and my cadillac gets dropped in for a service at the cadillac concierge so we've seen a lot more of these but there was a long time that whatever we would do mm -hmm. we would have another concierge firm go have you ever been interested in going down to the titanic have you ever been interested in walking the white carpet with elton john at the oscar party have you ever been interested in sitting front row at milan we can make it happen and then all they do is wait for them to get the emails and then they phone us up and say steve can we buy the tickets off you yeah so yeah. for many years there would be so many concierge firms that would actually, you'd put a newsletter out mm -hmm. and almost see it pop up over 20 different places. Um, and there was a time where we would go, yeah, okay, then we'll do that. And we would supply it. And then what would happen is people would come to us and they'd go, oh, yeah, we're thinking of joining your club. And we're, we're five grand just to get our phone number, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and we are the best, hands down. Um, but they would come to us and they'd say, I'm not sure about joining. And I'd be mm -hmm. like, well, why not? Well, Johnny over there does the exact same. Right. And he doesn't charge membership, or he charges two and a half grand. Mm -hmm. And we'd be like, but hang on a minute, Johnny gets the stuff from us. Mm -hmm. But they don't know that. Right. So we actually stopped allowing these concierge firms. So we'd get concierge firms going, hey, I've got clients who want to go to the Milan Fashion Week. Bully for you. Spend 23 years getting a relationship to make it happen and send them there yourself. Yeah. So we wow. would stop. And we've had some people actually be very very sneaky, they've actually joined membership mm -hmm. to get the access to then send to that client. Uh, yeah, we yeah. found that out and we've killed the membership. So wow. we're very private on, uh, uh, we're very careful on who we allow to be a member and we're very careful on who we allow to pretend as though they have the access. So these are clients usually high end, right? I mean, we're talking affluent clients that want to make miracles happen, correct? We're not talking about well, average they're, scenarios. They're, they're, aff they're affluent clients. Right that want a simpler life. So we handle everything from travel, um, hard to get restaurant bookings, you know, backstage or great tickets to an event, all the way through to going to the greatest Oscar party and going to fashion weeks and, and singing on stage with your favorite rock band. So there's quite a dynamic in the range that we offer. We have some clients that just use us because of our phenomenal travel service. They travel every week, everywhere, somewhere. They've got to have someone on hand or on call. You know, they, they use us just for that. So it's quite a broad spectrum on the people that work with us, but yes, they're all affluent. What's the future you see for it? How long do you see yourself running this? Well, 
I suppose the quick answer to that is when I stop having fun, you know, <laughs> when people stop dreaming. But I get people contact me every day and there's always like a weird dream or there's a, a, a weird fantasy or something that they want to do. And this is my key to get into rooms where I shouldn't be. Right. And I love being in those rooms. And I love kicking rockets in Elon Musk's rocket factory and just going, how the hell can I hit it? <laughs> Prod in this, um, I, I posted a picture the other day of me and Seth Green literally in the fuselage of one of Elon's rockets. Yeah. You know? That's amazing. How would this 17 year old <laughs> bricklayer have ever been able to do that? So, yeah. but I do, see, uh, I do see many things happening. We're releasing a new company called Taste of Blue, mm -hmm. which is uh, another membership based program, but it's a lower entry level point. Mm -hmm. And for those people that don't need the full expanse of what Bluefish does, um, I'm doing more consulting gigs. Mm -hmm. um, I'm doing some mentor programs where I'm working with other uh, entrepreneurs where I take my perspective and do a 30,000 foot view on what they're doing, why they're doing it, and just question, question why out of the hell of it, mm -hmm. um, just to get them down to that core. Um, the book's done very well for me getting uh, a lot more speaking gigs, so right. I'm doing a lot more traveling with that. But my fear is that I stop having fun. Mm -hmm. And so all the time I'm having fun, I'm not stopping. <laughs> how many have you done so far? How, how many what? How many gigs, how many miracles have you made happen? Um, Would you say from that first time in Hong Kong till today? Oh, jeepers. To some people, being able to get into a restaurant that they never thought they could get into is a miracle. Mm -hmm. To another, putting them on stage where they actually got to sing four tunes with their favorite rock band live on in concert in San Diego, that's a miracle. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. We've got um, got a couple of thousand clients worldwide. Uh, we're an international company, and we're constantly doing stuff for them. So thousands. What are yeah. some of the wildest requests you've heard? Uh, well, we had a client that, that went through an adrenaline fix, and he <laughs> wanted to do basically the fastest speed on anything he could mm -hmm. out of every category so yeah. we did things like putting him in uh, military fighter jets mm -hmm. in russia we put him on a, a formula one power boat mm -hmm. um we put him in a formula one race car mm -hmm. we put him in a bugatti mm -hmm. um street car but the real thing that i think scared the crap out of him was we actually put him on a two-seater moto gp Ducati mm -hmm. and had him raced around a racetrack by a former MotoGP winner. <laughs> so you're on a racetrack doing 200 mile an hour, holding on to a guy. You're, you're fully immersed there. Yeah. Everything else that we spoke about, you kind of had this bubble around you. Mm -hmm. Like when you're in a car or even a Formula One car, mm -hmm. it's only the top of you that's sticking out of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when you're on a motorbike, your whole limbs and everything, you're fully, fully engaged in the experience. Um, so we did that. That was cool. I did like sticking a client. Um, on stage at a Journey concert where he actually sang four tunes uh, wow. as the shortest termed lead singer of the rock band Journey. Um, <laughs> I surprised a dentist with a guitar lesson with ZZ Top because yeah. he collected ZZ Top guitars. Yeah. And so his wife set me up to actually get him a guitar lesson with, with Billy ZZ. Gibbons. Wow. Um, so uh, we did obviously the Academia. Um, How about Elton John? What was the connection with so that? So Elton John, I, um, Elton John is a powerful philanthropist in the cause of AIDS mm -hmm. um, and one of the God, I don't want to be rude and say one of the last musical icons, but there's so many there's so many artists coming out nowadays that there's very few Michael Jacksons left. Mm -hmm. You know, right. and legends, icons, yeah. Exactly. You mm -hmm. know, Elvis was one, Michael was Elton. You know, you just, he's one of these people that your kids know the music. You know, the, the music had come on TV, and my 12 year old would just like start singing Tiny Dancer or something. You know, <laughs> yeah. just, it's iconic. Mm -hmm. um, and he's such a showman. He's one of the last great entertainers. True. Um, a lot of entertainers nowadays, you stick them on stage with a microphone, they're screwed. Yeah. Unless they've got a full backing panel yeah, and true. someone tweaking it and auto tuning it, can't sing for shit. Um, but Elton gets on there. He could be in a bar with a microphone and a, and a freaking triangle and be brilliant. Um, and uh, so, you know, we got connected because they have the Oscar party every year with all of the A-list. And uh, we ended up partnering with that. And we get the right people to attend and we support the cause. 
And there's nothing cooler than just walking down the white, the white carpet. He has a white carpet, not a red carpet, because he's Elton. And um, walking down the white carpet with just like A-list celebrities. I actually, I'm always stunned at where you get, and we touched on this earlier, where you get impactful advice from. Mm. Because we all know powerful speakers and entertainers that can drivel on for two hours. And at the end of it, you go, that was wonderful, but I got no actionable advice out of it. Um, and then there'll be someone stood in a line at a Starbucks that will just say something to you and you'll go, why haven't I done that? You know? So it's always interesting to me where I get this advice from. I was on the white carpet and the, uh, the, media, the media lineup was ready. The celebrities were dripping in. Now, what you don't see on TV is they're all bunched up and they're eked out so that they don't all come out at once. So, you know, they wait for the flow out and then they call the next person and so on. Steven Tyler was in front of me. Who the hell doesn't like Steven Tyler, you know? And I was chatting with him and I was thrilled that they had bunched up everyone on, on this carpet. Because <laughs> right. I'm now talking to Steven Tyler. Perfect networking uh, opportunity. Yeah. He's one of the coolest guys in the world. So I'm talking to him, you know, obvious thing, when I die, Dream On is my theme tune, all that kind of stuff. So we're having a chat. And uh, everything was nice, everything was sociable, you know, we're just having small talk. And I turned around to him and I said, it's pretty cool walking down the white carpet and getting the photograph. That's pretty cool, isn't it? And he turned, he turned around, kind of half turned around, because he didn't even, he didn't make eye contact on this statement, but he turned around and he said, you know, no one ever gets to see the photographs for the journey it took to get me to this white carpet. And then he turns around, they called his name and he went out there and I thought, they don't. The red carpet and the white carpet is about 15 feet. And in some places, it's five feet and it's just cropped, right. you know? But in, in that event, it's, it's, it's about 25 feet in, in that long entrance into Elton's party. And I suddenly thought, no, that, that's, 100, that's 50 feet or something. No one sees the pain. No one sees the bankruptcies. No one sees the sues. No one sees the litigations. No one sees the pain, the divorces, the heartache, mm -hmm. the, you know, using your credit cards to pay your, your staff's phone bill. No one sees all that. Mm -hmm. They see a photograph that you post on Instagram and they go, you got it made. You don't see this. You don't see the shit mm -hmm. that it took for me to be able to take that photograph. Right. And that was just, I remember that and they, they called, you know, cause I do a lot of work. They, they called my name out for some photographs. And I still remember standing there going, oh, wow. <laughs> oh, it's me, you know? And yeah. so it was one of those moments. Absolutely. Now, what do you think that people, or what do you hope people take away from your story? Not just in the book, Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen, but for people out there that, you know, are maybe in that position that you were at 17 where you wanted more for your life and didn't know where to go and they might be listening to this podcast or watching this episode, what advice would you offer people who are just kind of lost and want more and don't know where to go? Um, it, it's within you and it's within absolutely everyone. You're talking now to a 17 year old bricklayer that just got up and didn't tolerate being where he was. Okay. If you are one of those people that settle, if you walk into a restaurant, they give you a bad table and you're okay to sit there, then no, don't read the book, you know, sell for life. Good for you. Game on. <laughs> I'm talking to the people to go, hang on. I want a better table to walk up to the maitre d' and go, excuse me. I need a better table than that. I'm not willing to sit at that table. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I want to talk to those people that are looking for something better, not willing to settle. Mm -hmm. Now I had nothing. Um, and I have built everything myself and I'm here because I put myself there. You can't go toe to toe to me because people go, oh, he must have known some rich people. Oh, his parents must have been rich. Yeah, they owned a construction firm. That must have been a multi-million dollar. It was my mum and my dad. Those were the people that owned the construction firm. And sometimes on a weekend building patios and porches, there were three of us, you know? So I didn't have the things that you want to give your natural excuses for. Right. So get out of the way of your excuses, get out of the way of the size of your butt, and just do one thing that gets you a little bit closer to where you want to be mm -hmm. than you are now. That could be Googling it. That could be reading a book on it. That could be... Um, buying a t-shirt. If you want, if you want a, if you want a Gucci shirt, uh, a Gucci suit, 
Maybe buy a Gucci belt or a Gucci pair of socks. Mm -hmm. Just get yourself one closer. I had a client of mine that had always wanted to stay in an affluent hotel. Mm -hmm. And they were a, a mentoring client of mine. And they said, oh, I've always wanted to stay in the Ritz Cohen. Yeah. All right. So I took them there for tea. Literally just took them there for afternoon tea. Yeah. And we had tea and I went, you now know what it's like to walk through. You don't know what it's like to stay in a room. Mm -hmm. You don't know what it's like to check into the front desk. Mm -hmm. You don't know any of that. But you now know what it's like to walk through the front door and walk out the door. And all this cost me a couple of sandwiches and a cup of tea. <laughs> but you've got the experience. So I'm telling people now, get out of the way of yourself. Stop thinking it's impossible. Because if you think it's impossible, it is. And it's only impossible until someone does it. So just go forward and try the first thing. I love that. And then at the end of every podcast, we always play a game called First Things First. So the way the game works is I'm going to list off uh, 10 words or phrases, and then you tell me the first word or phrase that comes to mind. Does that make sense? It does. We've got a game now. That's right. <clears throat> so the only rule is that you can't repeat yourself twice. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to rifle through the 10. You ready? All right. First word, impossible. Until someone does it. Second, passion. If there's no passion, there's no point. Persistence. It's fuel. Relationships. Best thing in the planet. Money. Pays the bills. <laughs> Fear. To be where I am next week, where I am today. Fear makes me want to go forward. Blue fishing. The art of not seeing it impossible. Mm. Your past. A good story. Your present. The next chapter. And last one is your legacy. Activating people to not accept where they are. I love it. That's a wrap. Mr. Steve Sims, thanks for being on the show today. Cheers, pal. Thank you guys for tuning into this week's episode, and be sure to check out Steve's book, Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen, if you guys want to hear more. As always, I want to encourage you guys to live strong and live with passion. We'll see you guys next time. Peace.